Well, good afternoon. Uh, this is Mitch Weisberg here for EdChat Interactive. Uh, tonight, or this afternoon, I should say, um, this afternoon we're having a session on personalized learning. And uh, this has actually come up, um, it's big in the news right now because of what's going on in, in Los Angeles because the teachers are basically rightfully uh, saying, how do you expect us to teach these classes with 40 kids in the class? Um, and and we, when, we, when we don't have all the resources we need, and, um, you know, as a society, we have to do something about this. So uh, we're going to have Sam Brooks and Lance Key talking uh, talking to us and explaining how they're going about it. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for you all to interact with them, ask them questions, uh, text with them. And uh, now I have to find where Sam went. Um, hi, Lance. I'm looking hey, for how are you. For Sam now, and I can bring him up too. Um, and I'll close my slides and bring up your slides where, where we're going. So, uh, where are you all geographically? We are in uh, Cookville, Tennessee, uh, which is halfway between Nashville and Knoxville, Tennessee. Straight uh -huh. line right dead in the center. Oh, okay. And um, so, so you all. I mean, I'm sure you have slides for this, but you have, you all have this program called Vital. Could you just describe that a little bit? Sure. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah. yeah um, Vital was a program that was uh, born in, in 2008, uh, back in a time when really uh, a lot of the digital learning at that at that time began as credit recovery opportunities for students who mm -hmm. were behind. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that wasn't going very well pre-2008, so the, the Vital program was born and. VITAL stands for Virtual Instruction to Accentuate Learning. So we wanted to take a look at uh, some virtual uh, possibilities that might exist in Putnam County Schools and see how we might uh, grow that over time. So we started out a course uh, with credit recovery and created a mechanism uh, for support within our district for our schools, uh, basically our 9 through 12 schools at that time, that were using uh, the labs, uh, really was the only technology we had. and and trying to get those students to where they needed to be and, and really caught up. Um, so that's how it started and it's grown into a lot of different things now. Uh, and we'll talk about a, a lot of different things that we do. Um, but we, we basically handle uh, all dual, uh, all credit recovery, uh, any initial credit online or digital offering that we have in our, in our district, uh, as well as all dual enrollment, dual credit, industry certification through a CT program. And then also uh, we have a, a K through eight homeschool uh, that we run through our district in Putnam County. Uh, all said, we entertain between 1,200 to uh, 1,500 students uh, every nine week period uh, in the offerings that we have, including the dual enrollment and, and dual credit uh, in all of our online initial credit offerings and credit recovery um, mm -hmm. for any given nine week period with this program. So that seems to, to kind of offer a relief from some of the pressure cooker that, um, you know, kids who aren't getting what they need to from the classroom have in many, you know, additional outlet either to catch up or to allow them to forge ahead. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And, and I think in the past, that's definitely a, a lot of the motivation. But as we've started to personalize learning um, in the regular traditional classroom, it's, it's, it's got to a situation where, uh, you know, someone who used to be a regular traditional teacher now is learning more about personalizing their classroom um, mm -hmm. to student need. And so it, it's actually growing inside uh, of our classrooms across the district. And we work with a partner uh, called Education Elements the last two years, and, and we'll go with them also again next year in our third year. So we, we started integration of personalized learning in a middle school the first year. Uh, we're in elementary schools right now uh, in our second year. And we'll move that into high schools in our third year and trying to re reinvent the classroom. It's not something that we make our teachers do, uh, but it's something that we show them how it works and how it can uh, allow them to reach the individual needs of students in their own classroom. And, and when we do that, it tends to grow uh, within that school. Fascinating. So what, what I think what I'll do is I'll pull myself down 
and you know, let you two talk so I'm not in your way, and just encourage people, if um, Sam or Lance say things that uh, you feel that you can add to, uh, use the text chat box you know, to feed them remarks, and or also click on the raise hand button, and we can bring you up on stage as well to further the conversation. Okay? Okay. So, okay. Uh, there you go. Thanks, just Mitch. I appreciate me, it. Yeah. I'm going yeah, to go ahead. ahead. What's that? Okay. Uh, Lance, I'm gonna, you go ahead and start with uh, the tools and, and some of the things that we had discussed, and, and that's probably going to drive some questions as we, as we move forward. Sure. So, uh, Mitch, I don't know if I can change these slides or not or if you have to do that, uh, but I, I thank you. Uh, I'm Lance Key. I'm the Instructional Technology Specialist uh, here in Putnam County uh, on the first slide there. And we can share these slides out with everyone if we need to. Um, has got two of our titles, two of our sessions at FETC. We've got our whole list of sessions you'll see in a slide or two. Uh, these, are, these are some of the certifications that I've got here. I'll also be speaking at ISTE, as Sam will be also. Uh, but we're both Google certified trainers and featured speakers at, uh, at FETC this year. Uh, so about myself, I started this uh, personalized learning track about nine years ago um, in the classroom. I teach integrated math. Uh, some of you may know it as algebra, geometry, algebra two. Uh, we call it integrated math one, two, and three in our district here. Um, it's all though was I'd work and I'd teach my heart out every day with students. And then I'd send them home with homework to work on uh, with their parents. And they come back to school the next day and then have their homework done. And I come to find out the reason they didn't was uh, they didn't have a coach at home or a parent at home that could help them actually work through the algebra content that they needed to. So about nine years ago, I thought, well, what about if I started making videos? And that time we were, we were using iPods uh, and, and put these videos on iPods for these students and sent them home and, and let them do the lower levels of blooms at home and then come back to school and work with me on the higher levels of blooms, the creations and, and the analyzing, all those things, because you know, then they could work with an expert in the room. So started there about nine years ago, working on that. Uh, and then it's kind of grown into what it, what it has today. And that was called a flip classroom. I like to say I was flipping before flipping was cool. Um, <laughs> but, and didn't even know what it was back then. Uh, it's grown into so much more today uh, with pre-testing and looking where students are at and, and meeting students' needs on a daily basis exactly where they're at. So that's kind of introduction to who I am and uh, where it's grown into uh it's so many more things that hopefully we'll get to today sam go ahead and flip that there you go um just a real quick uh, a lot of the same things lance said you know we've been working together for a while now and and uh happy to do uh sessions at these conferences i found out when you know a lot of times the way we get to go is to do a session and then we get to go to all these other great things that that other schools and other teachers and other administrators are doing across the nation and, and learn stuff. So that's kind of our buy-in for traveling and, and being a part of those things. And we really enjoy that. And, our, you know, we've added some things to our program as we've gone along that we've learned from other districts across the nation that, that may be a little bit further than us. So uh, happy to do those things and real happy to be here talking to you guys today. And we're going to hit a few things, but I think the pertinent thing is the questions that you're going to ask along the way that has to do with, with your particular uh, situation that, that you're going through. And, you know, we started this way back in 2008. So everything that you're going to see and we're going to talk about didn't happen overnight. Um, it, it was uh, kind of start very small, uh, experience some success, learn what the students need and then grow it from there. Because if the students and the parents are happy and they're getting what they want out of it, it's going to grow automatically. So that's kind of the way we've approached it. And uh, we're lucky enough to have a director in our district. His name is Jerry Boyd. That is a full support of all the things that we do and and really honestly a, a lot of the vision um, behind a lot of the things that we're going to talk about okay fast forward that mitch so here's the list of uh presentations if you come to fetc and uh there's a particular topic you want to see this is when our sessions will be and uh you can come see us at, at either a uh, poster session talking about uh maker spaces or uh, you can come see us at uh, and talk about flipped classrooms, flexible seating. We'll have it going on in all of these. So just come by and see us. We'll, we'll enjoy having you there with us. Uh, go ahead to the next slide there, Mitch. Uh, we've got uh, 
We've got a free Google Summit that we provide. So we're both Google certified trainers. If you're around the Tennessee area, you want to come hang out with us. We had about 600 teachers last year. Uh, the sign up is at vitalgoogle.com. And then over to the right, there is uh, there's some publications there. Uh, if you click on those links, uh, they'll take you out to some publications that Vital has had uh, in the last month, actually, uh, just about what's going on in Putnam County. All right, next slide. Sam, I'll let you talk about our personalized learning definition here in the district. Okay, you know, when, when we started down the, the road of personalized learning in a traditional classroom, we were already doing all these other things uh, with the digital world and the online classes that we, we've been doing a while. And so what we wanted to take some of those opportunities in, inside the traditional teacher's classroom so they can meet the needs of their students, uh, whether it be a, a, a 25th percentile and below student, a bubble kid in the middle, or a 92nd percentile and above. So one of the first steps for Putnam County, uh, I was lucky enough to serve at the state level on the personalized learning task force uh, with the Tennessee Department of Education. So we just kind of mimicked that in Putnam County and created our own task force because we needed to define what personalized learning was going to mean for Putnam County. Because depending upon where you go, personalized learning can mean a number of different things. And so we had to make sure that our teachers and our administrators and uh, all of our uh, co-workers in Putnam County and our students and families uh, understood what we were talking about when we were talking about personalized learning. So I'll just touch on a couple of things here and I've got them highlighted. Uh, you know, personalized learning empowers students with voice and choice. So having some control of what their learning path is and giving them a voice and and maybe how they learn best and, and what assignments to meet the need of the teacher uh, that they would like to do uh, in that learning process. And then it is student centered and it's facilitated by the teacher. We feel like facilitate is an important word in there, too, because it gives the teacher the opportunity to facilitate learning of a lot of kids versus standing up in front of a class and talking. Uh, and expecting students to gain knowledge that way in the traditional manner. And it's based on each learner's mastery of the standards. Standards are important. They're the blueprint. They're the baseline that every student needs to, to uh, have the ability to, to hear, see, and touch. Uh, and it's built on a premise that learning can happen uh, anytime and anywhere, whether it's at McDonald's, at home, at school, um, on a vacation in Hawaii, or, or wherever they are, on a snow day. <laughs> that's not a popular thing right now in Putnam County, but uh, and in flexible learning spaces. And this personalized learning approach will take into account the learner's skills, learning style, abilities, and interests, which creates, uh, you know, student buy-in, and it creates a, a situation where we can uh, bring that learning to their level and what interest they might have as they go through their K-12 uh, experience here in Putnam County. Go ahead and flip that. This, this is my favorite slide as it comes through, and Lance will, Lance will touch on this going into the next slide, too. Sometimes we don't talk about the why. You know, why are you hearing this from the national level? Why, why are teachers hearing this from the state level? Why are uh, teachers hearing this from the board level, the, the county district level? Uh, to me, this is a telling slide. You know, 65% of the jobs our students will have in five years, and that's actually a little shorter than that now, but the jobs that are going to exist in five years, they're not even a job right now today. And the, the common thread in all of those jobs that are going to exist is the use of technology. So we feel like in Putnam County, if, if our teachers and our administrators are not showing kids how to use technology in the right way, we're missing the boat. We're, we're not doing what is right for them to try and capture some of these jobs in their future. So we don't want technology to be the guide in Putnam County of a class, but we want our teachers to be able to use it as a solid tool for differentiation in our classrooms. And what does that mean? We, we don't consider a teacher giving a kid a Chromebook and putting them on an object for 60 minutes and calling that class. We're, we're not talking about that. The, the technology does not need to drive the student learning. It needs to be a tool for the teacher to drive the student learning. So some teachers feel when we start talking about this, they're going to re be replaced by a computer. 
we are definitely not talking about that in Putnam County. We're talking about personalized and learning for the student need and using that computer as a tool in the classroom. All right, and we'll flip through the next few slides uh, fairly quickly. Uh, you'll see on the next slide here, uh, this has actually already been approved by the, the government. Uh, I don't know when they're going to exactly start uh, building this, but this, I've heard a couple of different names for it. Uh, the main one I've heard so far is called the Hyperloop. Uh, this is a mass transportation so that you can go from the east coast of the United States to the west coast of the United States in under three hours. Okay, it's going to be uh, kind of like a vacuum tube, uh, and the sounds put on there is anyone thinking the Jetsons. Uh, there's also there's also one that they're talking about building right now that will go under sea under the sea and take you from the United States over to Europe uh, in just a few hours. On the next slide, you'll see the flying car that they're working on, and, and I saw this at first, and I was like, um, okay, this this might could happen, but but then when I heard who was trying to produce it. Uber is the one that's actually working on producing this car right now. Um, and so they would, they would fly and they'll pick you up and then they will take off again and fly and then drop down to where they're going to deliver you to. Uh, and if, if any of you have been to Nashville lately and seen all the traffic that there is in Nashville, this could save lots of time. So uh, this is already in production and they're, they're testing these right now. Uh, and then the last one here, uh, Amazon. And this is big for us in Tennessee right now because uh, Amazon's uh, headquarters, one of their headquarters has moved to Tennessee and we have, uh, have many factories that uh, of Amazon here around here, but they're, they're doing same day delivery. So my wife, if she gets online and orders that purse that she wants, she can get it the same day. So who would have thought that flying a drone uh, could be a job? So all these kids that are gamers and doing all this, uh, they, can, they will have a job now doing this. Uh, flying drones and packages to places. Now, they, they, that's what they call it, you know, most places. In Tennessee, though, it may become target practice. So <laughs> I, I can see uh, some people that, that live uh, near us in the hills uh, maybe taking some, some skeet practice or something like that with this. But just thinking at the type of jobs that's going to be out there for students, problem-solving skills they're going to have to have, creation skills, things like that. And if you go into what we previously would have called a factory, and see a factory now is it's totally different. Uh, when I when I grew up, uh, I worked at a uh, a place where we painted drive shafts, and it was it was hot and nasty and dirty. Uh, you go into a, a factory now, like um, an Amazon, or we've got Academy Sports here, one of their large factories here, and they're clean and pristine. And you've got uh, robots that that are running around picking packages, and you got people that are programming robots. So. Um, the job market is kind of shifting. And I actually just saw a statistic today uh, that, that I wanted to share with you guys that says that by 2022, that there will be over $6 billion spent on training with virtual reality. $6 billion of training. So, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality. When I was in high school just 20 years ago, I didn't think that, that we would see something like that. But they say that surgeons are doing such better jobs with, with heart surgery, brain surgery, things like that, because they were able to go in. They've done this surgery so many times uh, with augmented reality. So as Sam was talking about the why, the why that we're doing this is because we're trying to prepare students to be successful in the future. So, so let's talk a little bit now about the how, the how to do this. So when we have, we have students come into our classroom and they're on multiple different levels, we've got to be able to entertain and teach them uh, on those multiple different levels. And there's only one of us to go around. So we have to leverage the tools that we have in place to be able to do that. Uh, and, you know, one of the ways that, that I feel like, or the strongest way that, that I feel like that we can do that is, is by pre-testing. How are you going to meet a student at their level when you don't know the level that they're at? So there was a slide I wish we would have added in here. It's, uh, it's a um, oil well, and it's got many different oil wells inside of there. And it represents it's uh, different students at different student levels in your classroom. And uh, actually, I may pull that up in a minute if I can find it and share my screen. But we have many different levels of students that come in our classroom. And, and as a classroom teacher, I was guilty before I started personalizing the learning to my students of teaching right towards the middle. And, you know, trying to, to hit the middle. And I'd get, you know, maybe 40% of my kids, those high level kids, I hope they learned just something. 
so that, you know, that state testing, they would grow a little bit. And the low-level kids, I hope that maybe I could get them to catch up. But I was, I was only servicing about 40% of my kids and not hitting 60% of the kids. So with the flipped classroom and with pre-testing now, I can see exactly where a student is in my classroom. And you know what? If they've mastered the content on that pre-test, they don't have to go through that unit. They're allowed, I'll let them go on. We use uh, LMS here, uh, Canvas. And I've got, uh, for my classes, I've got sixth grade math through AP Calculus built out. So students, as long as they're mastering content, they can continue to move along. And because it's taught in the flip manner, all that content's there for them, and they just move on to the next lesson. And guess what? The, the students who are, are high level, they may only need me two to three minutes a day. And, and I can go over and I can see them. I can have conversations with them. And then I can uh, just push them to, to the next level as they need it. But then I might, you know, my, my 40 to 60 percent students, they may need me 10 to 15 minutes a day. You know, and I could spend that time one on one with them, helping them with what they need. But then my, you know, my, my 20th percentile below, I may spend 30 to 40 minutes one on one working with those students every day and, and being able to teach it in the flip manner to where they've got the content that's available to them. And I'm there as the expert troubleshooting and helping those guys as they need it. You know, it really makes it flexible for me so that I can spend one on one time with them uh, on, on the title slide here. Uh, a couple of things I point out. One, uh, if you could go follow us on Twitter. My math students beat me up every now and then about my ratio on Twitter. Uh, I'm happy they know what a ratio is. So if you could go follow, <laughs> follow us on Twitter, help me with my ratio uh, there. Also, uh, the content that I use in our LMS is at mrkeysclassroom.com. So if you're a math teacher or you need help supporting math teachers, that content's there and you're free to use that. Sam? Well, I mean, you know, you hit the the gist of it and a lot of the questions that I, I saw previous to this, you know, basically is with ed, ed tech helping teachers in the classroom and that that's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, we try and identify the right tools uh, for the lot, right classrooms and, you know, not really, uh, uh, you know, not allow teachers to go out and look for things that they think might be pertinent and very good for the classroom, but make sure it's on the, the rigor of the standard and the expectation of the standard as they introduce these tools. Um, so, it, you know, we, we push that, we help them do that. We support them in professional development with a lot of these ed tech tools that they're using. And that's exactly what Lance's job is um, here in Putnam County. And we just want to be able to support our principals and our teachers with uh, these opportunities that exist, but frame it, you know, in the right way where it's going to be productive for our students uh, and, and giving them the opportunity to, you know, get uh, the personalized education that they need to meet their needs. And I'm wondering, how did you get teacher buy-in? Because, you know, it's likely teachers, um, you know, start off, they're used to teaching in a certain way, and now you're kind of pulling the rug out from them and saying, no, no, we want you to teach a very different way. How do you how do you get the teachers to buy into this? So one, one thing that, that I've noticed is when we can show teachers – a way that we can give them time back in their day and then they can get more one-on-one -on -one time with the students. That was the big buy-in that we had, you know, because uh, the biggest, the biggest thing that we get from our teachers is we don't have enough time. So when we start, start showing them ways in their classroom, whether it's using Google forms for formative assessments or, you know, us working as a team to build out things in the canvas, uh, you know, how you can spend more one-on-one -on -one time, with those lower level students so that you can show growth with those guys. Uh, that is, is, is how we bought buy-in or got buy-in with them. And the other big thing that we've got is we actually surveyed our students last year after they went through the personalized learning uh, classroom. And we said, what's the one thing that, that you would, that, that you like that you got this year that you haven't had in the previous years. And we're, we're thinking, you know, more time on technology, things like that. But the, the number one thing that all of our students wanted was more time with the student or with the teachers. They like the one on one time, that personal relation, that time where they can ask their teacher what's going on. You know, where they felt like that that teacher wanted to be there with them. Because mm -hmm. let's, let's face it, a lot of times at home now, they don't get that anymore. Moms and dads are working and, and they're just, you know, they're accepting you're seeking that acceptance from that from that teacher. Yep. Lance on the other side. Of, go ahead, Mitch. I'm sorry. You were well, no, no. I was, I was going to say so. So on, you know, I can I can see 
students really loving the fact that they're getting more time to establish relations with the teacher because learning is, is it's just, it's social. Um, was there professional development that you had for the teachers, or did you just basically oh, yeah. it out for them? You know, the, the first was digital. You know, we, we have a lot of teachers in the district that, you know, computers aren't something that many of our teachers grew up with. <laughs> so devices and learning how to use them uh, in that way, whether it be Google Classroom or our Canvas learning management system to, you know, to have a place to host a class, um, mm -hmm. that, that took some training. And we, you know, we don't twist their arm to make them do anything as long as they're doing a great job in the classroom and, and moving students. And that's what the, the principals are looking for. But the training, you know, we, we did work with, we thought it was important enough to, bring in for some professionals who are a little bit further along than us and education elements and Anthony Kim fit that mold for us. And we, we researched them for about three years um, before we decided to pull the trigger and bring them into our district because teachers are very finicky uh, and want, you know, the, the right thing for them in their classroom. And we had to make sure this is where we wanted to go and what we wanted to push out in the way that we wanted to do it. So the way that they promote uh, personalized learning is, is not so much about the, pushing the use of a computer in the classroom as it is making the, the teacher the focal point of the lessons uh, and all the instruction that's going forward in the classroom and giving that teacher time to do what they need to do as a teacher in the classroom and meet the needs of the students. And because they approach it that way, there's as much buy-in on the teacher side for this as there is on the student side. Students like it because they're more engaged and everything means more to them because it's, it's categorized in a way that means uh, something to them in their future. Um, and for teachers, it's just giving them time back in their day to, to be able to work with those students more, giving them tools uh, to meet the student need in ways that they never could before. And a great example is that a teacher starts their lesson in the day. They may have a, a, a station rotation going at a station, maybe has six Chromebooks, and they may have prepared a mini lesson for those students at that station using an app we love called Screencastify or Loom. Uh, mm -hmm. that video records that teacher in that minimal introduction to that lesson. And so those students are at that Chromebook station hearing that lesson from that teacher with their earbuds while that teacher has pulled three or four or five students that maybe uh, did not completely or fully understand the lesson from the day before. And they're differentiating that lesson and, and the teacher now has time to be able to do that. So just a lot of little things. And Lance, I, Lance and I have learned a lot from our teachers, uh, you know, since the the uh, beginning trainings on this, we go back to the classrooms and we see some of the ways that they've, uh, you know, brought together a lot of the things that we taught them and has created situations in a classroom that is moving students in ways that we never, we never even thought of. So it, it's a learning process on all sides. And yeah, one last thing on that, uh, as Sam said, we're, we're learning a lot from our teachers because they're, they're there on the forefront every day with them. Uh, and, and so many tools, especially for our special populations or uh, students that, that struggle generally in the classroom, the way they're taking some apps and extensions that we're teaching them on the front end, and then the ideas that they're coming up with of how they can use it and how they can, you know, make a difference in kids learning on a day-to-day -day basis, we're learning probably just as much as they are. Well, it sounds to me that like you're setting up an environment where you're teaching where teachers understand that they're professionals and they're treated as professionals and they're not treated as cogs and just as, as you know student voice is important you know you're not gonna the teachers aren't gonna give students voice so the teachers don't have voice also so it sounds like you're giving your teachers a lot of voice and and choice in the way they're conducting their classes yeah, and that's that's very important to our director he you know he wants to ball, involve everybody you know in any decisions that are made especially the teachers because they're on the ground floor and they are the ones that we need support because that's where learning happens. And have you seen the assessment of learning change also? Do you assess learning the same way you vote, you know, tests and quizzes or are there other ways of assessing learning that you're using? T tests and quizzes right now are, are a, 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 you know, a subject that's uh, being contested in a lot of ways, especially when you throw common core in there and a lot of other things that are, that are out there, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of a one day test, um, but I know it's something that we have to have. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot more to educating a student than a test. And there's a lot more that goes on at home sometimes than teachers know uh, that students are dealing with. And, you know, Lance hit on it a minute ago. And, you know, uh, the assessment, whether it's formative assessment, uh, assessment from tests or just uh, watching a kid by that increased time with their teacher, Mitch, 
the teacher mm-hmm. has a lot more times to 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 set single goals for students based on what their data is. So that's where the data piece fits in. But Lance hit on it a minute ago. Our, our best teachers and our best rooms and our best growth are with teachers who have a personal relationship with their students. And, yeah. and personalized learning gives them more data, uh, more points to analyze what student need uh, is in their classroom, which helps to create personal learning experiences with their teachers. And I think that's at the, you know, if we're, we're doing all these other things for the whole child and trying to learn about their family and what life is at home. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes kids come to school without their homework, but teachers don't know enough to ask why not. And, and they, if they ask, they'd realize they didn't do their homework because their mom and dad are working and they were watching the two kids at home that night. Right. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things that go on. We, we just want to give them the opportunity and meet the need for them to understand the standards uh, and give teachers the ability and the tools to be able to meet the needs of that student, no matter what those needs are. And, and so, you know, we're, we're not there yet. And, and it's a continual process. And we've been on this journey for a long, long time. But I, I think as long as we're keeping the, st- uh, the student at the center of the attention, uh, then we're going to be on the right pathway. One of the other things, too, that, I, that I've noticed as we move down this path, we're, we're starting to see teachers uh, branch out in ways that uh, students can show mastery of content. So, you know, no longer is it that test, but also, you know, maybe so the kids like to write. So they might go into Book Creator and they might make a book over, you know, the, the Tundra or, or something like that. Or they may go into Google Slides and do a slideshow presentation or they, they may grab Screencastify and they may make their own video of them. Uh, showing that they know how know the content. So, you know, and that's a lot of the voice and choice that students that we want to to put out there. You know, what do you like to do? How do you want to show us that you know that you know this content? Because the, the at the end of the day, it's have you mastered the content? You know, and, and the learning style, uh, you know, we shouldn't dictate that. You know, if, if you can show me that you can master this content by writing a book for me, go for it. Because you may be an author someday. You know, if you can show it to me through you getting up and presenting, you might want to get up on a stage someday and present in front of people. Uh, so I, I think that's one of the big things that we've seen is it's giving the the teachers and the students, as you said, a voice and that flexibility to show us how do you know this content. So I'd also like to encourage if, if uh, any of the participants here would like to come up and you know, share examples or ask questions, just, you know, click on that raise hand button and I'll bring you up, I'll, I'll, I'll come down. But in the, in the meantime, just another related question that I had is, um, you know, we think, I guess we, we've used, you know, didactics to teach where, the, you know, the teacher is teaching and the student's following or maybe, or there's a book and the student is going through the book. Is it, are the things that te- that the students are doing in the classroom changing? Is there is there um, you know is uh, are there more project based learning? Is it or is it still is it still divided into subjects? How how has that changed? So uh, you know the the content and people talk to me about Common Core Math and things like that all the time uh, because I'm a math teacher and you know they want they always want to pick my brain on that. You know, I always tell myself, well, the laws of the universe have, have not changed. Uh, so until, until the laws of the universe change, you know, science, math, they're not going to change. It, it just is what it is. But what we're seeing is, and this is why we, we spend a lot of the time talking on the why, uh, when, we, when we talk about personalized learning, what we see is the ability to be able to use those and to prepare students to be problem solvers is bigger now than it ever has been before. Because... You know, augmented reality, virtual reality, um, you know, factories that that are mainly run by robots on the floor, you know, being able to program those robots, uh, self-driving cars. Uh, Tennessee Tech worked with Google years ago, which is in our backyard. Uh, and luckily, I was able to work on that project on the first uh, autonomous car. Um, and most people don't realize that Google Maps has been uh, an autonomous car driving around doing all this with, you know, a driver that's there with them. But being able to to be able to prepare students, as, as Sam said, though, for those jobs that we don't really know what's going to be, um, because if, if somebody would have told me in 1999 when I was graduating high school that uh, through augmented reality someday I could go anywhere in the world and, and interact with people in the world, I never would have believed it. 
So, so what do we have coming down the pike? We don't know, but what we do know is it's going to involve technology and it's going to involve us having students be able to problem solve and be able to, to take a situation and be able to, to figure out a plan of how to get through that. Sam, do you want to add to that? Oh, that was pretty good. I'm, I'm answering a few questions on here. We, we're getting some oh, questions. Right. On. One of them, Paige mentioned Seesaw. I'm a huge fan of Seesaw. It, you can do a whole lot in the classroom with Seesaw, and it really it really benefits that personalized learning classroom page. For, so thanks for popping that up there. So I'm going to bring Vicki Cobb up. She raised her hand. And, um, and, and Vicki is always very interesting. <laughs> And knowledgeable, Vicky. I'm kind of, I'm kind of scared, Vicky. Oh, uh, she's connecting. Vicky, are you there? Can you? Ah, uh, user connection. Okay, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna try this again. Darn. So this is. Um, oh, there you are, Vicky. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. How are you? I'm very well, thank you very much, and I want to commend. The, um, so my age shows that I've already forgotten your names, but I really think I'm very excited about what you've done. I think it's really amazing. You, I just one question. First question is how much autonomy do the teachers have? I mean, I mean, this is this is a seems to be a big problem, and I know uh, what I'm fighting against is in literacy area is the reading bad writing which is from the hegemony of the textbook it's all bad writing and the worksheets are bad writing and how much uh, autonomy do teachers have to stray from w with the feeling of impunity from what you what what they think is required of them and so they cover it so their their ass is covered and everybody else is covered so that <laughs> so so lance lance and i are both just ready to dive in on this question so Neither one of us are ELA people, okay? So, but we've been involved with an ELA integration, and this will kind of describe our thought process in Putnam County. Um, we, in the past, and even still now, we've had ELA teachers just going uh, all over the place with what they were wanting to use in the, in the classroom, and hopefully based on the Tennessee State standards. So, uh, our directors come back, and we, we provided uh, our K, we're K through four in in the uh, elementary five through eight in the middle and nine through 12 in the high. And so we, we came back and provided a district ELA curriculum um, for the pre-K four, which is core knowledge. And we provided a uh, learn zillion for the five through eight ELA curriculum. Now what we want out of that uh, ELA curriculum is them to use that as, as a guide and a basis for rigorous standard alignment. Okay. And so what we feel like personalized learning is once that is taught, uh, once that is the base, because when we have, we got a lot of changeover in schools. So when a kid leaves one school in Putnam County, based on what their parents' job is, their need, and they go to another school, we want them to have similar, similar environments in learning when they go from one of our schools to another. And previous to this, it was all over the place. And, and so I think our only, uh, expectation is they use this resource that we provided as the main guide of their classroom work, but then personalize the learning based on student need um, to meet the need of that student that's 25th percentile and below or on the bubble and needs a little more or 92nd percentile and above. So the personalization comes into effect after they uh, use that curriculum uh, as the basis for understanding and learning and rigor uh, in that classroom. So every every kid gets the opportunity uh, you know, to take note of what, what they're going to be tested on as time goes on down the road. So that, that's one good example, but we're also in the process of identifying all the things that are being used at our schools and what our director does as, as the, uh, you know, the person who leads those principals at our schools. Uh, if they're wanting to buy something or use money for something, there's a new tool out there, then they have to justify to him on a face-to-face -face basis how this tool is going to be used to move uh, student data or student need in that particular school. And by doing that, it really justifies their thought process. And we don't have a lot of, of principals that are buying stuff just to buy stuff. Uh, 
And so it, it really it really categorizes the things and the tools that, that are used in the district. Lance, I know you want to touch on Lance was Lance was on the ed tech side of bringing in uh, that five through eight or five through 12 district curriculum into a digital format uh, in our Canvas LMS and creating something that was born of a traditional uh, manner, which Learn Zillion was. Learn Zillion really is just engage New York with a southern twang. Uh, and, and so uh, Lance was responsible for bringing that into our learning management system. And, and we, we think it's going to produce some great things down the road. But uh, I think in the beginning, we thought it was a little bit further developed uh, in the digital world than it, than it was. And we've had to come back and really uh, help that process along the way. Go ahead, Lance. Yeah, so, Can I just interrupt just one point? I'm just curious. These Learn Zillion and Engage New York, those are curriculum I'm not. I'm not a teacher anymore. I'm not a. I'm outside every system there is. So I, I, I'm I, gonna I got, call it. I'm gonna call it a curriculum resource. It's not a full curriculum. Right. So it, it's. But too, they say, you know, they the, the curriculum people make up a list of things and then they give it to the textbooks and they say this is not a this is not an outline and then the textbooks use it as an outline. So I'm just curious about all these <laughs> suggestions they have for curriculum. So go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just want to make sure because I, I'm, I am outside all of your systems that this is a curriculum guide. I'm learning a lot. Thank you. Sure. Keep going. No, no problem. No problem. So so the first thing was we actually we brought our teachers in and we looked at four or five different curriculum or curriculum resources, however you want to put that. And and they actually piloted it for a year. And they came together and they chose Learn Z and as their curriculum to use. Um, so what we did was we, we took the curriculum and we ingested it into what's uh, our learning management system, which is Canvas. Then this summer, we actually trained all of our teachers on how to use Canvas. And, and we trained, uh, we, we took our what we call master teachers and we had them build the, the uh, Putnam County English curriculum out. Uh, in Canvas using Learn Z. You know, there's always gaps in, that, that are in the curriculum, but we wanted to provide a viable curriculum for all of our teachers of, you know, this is your base. This is your base you're going to use. So we knew there was gaps. So we brought them together and we, we, we tried to fill all those gaps that we had. And they used some Engage New York. They used some, uh, you know, some other resources and tools that are out there to fill those gaps. Now we took that curriculum in Canvas. We, we have what's called a blueprint course, and we pushed it to every uh, fifth grade, sixth grade teacher. And then after that, um, you know, they're allowed to go in and personalize exactly how they want to teach that. So, you know, they may be teaching Shakespeare or Romeo and Juliet uh, in the classroom, and they feel like that it needs a, more of a different touch here or there. So they can go in and they can add that to that uh, to fill those gaps. Does that answer your question, Vicki? Yes. Um, may I offer something, or is this inappropriate? Oh, sure. Um, I'm very concerned with literacy in the content area and reading in the content area. Mm. And I have an organization of award-winning children's nonfiction authors called Ink Think Tank. It doesn't matter what our name is, but I just wanted to suggest to everybody we have a team resource on the web called the nonfiction minute which is an essay uh, by about two dozen of us is a new one every day and on different subjects and if they're archived and they have we really touch on i can't even tell you how many different subjects we are we started this five years ago we're in our fifth year we've had five million page views and we are, I mean, for example, I don't know who's reading us because we don't have enough money to find out. But, uh, for example, the day after Christmas, uh, if you go to www.nonfiction.org, we're a nonprofit. If you go there, we, we got our numbers for December 26th, and they were 3,939 page views on that day after Christmas. So I'm just saying this is for... I would say grade three, twelve. There's an audio file for let's more challenged readers of the author reading his or her own minute. They're self-contained, original, 
uh, essays and they have been collected into two books. So, I mean, th this is something that if you wanted to uh, do now or you want to see, what, kids, what am I interested in? I mean, the web is great. Well, what you know, you don't know, but it's not great to find what you don't know, you don't know. But if you read a nonfiction minute of 400 words, it might give you a clue as to something that might be it for to, to, in order to diversify the content they're reading. Cool. Gotcha. I came here Thank to you. let everybody know about yeah. that. Because okay. I, but I also to write me, my Twitter handle is at Vicki Cobb, and it's, you know, I'm not hard to find. So. <laughs> And we're about to start a podcast on using these wow. audio files. Awesome. Okay, well, thank uh, you. Mitch, uh, yeah, there's Mitch, a got, question I, from Barbara. Did you see? Yeah, did, uh, I've got did a question you, here. Sam, do you okay. got that also? No, no, I just sent it to Lance. To you, Lance. Uh, okay. I'm gonna, actually, I'm going to publish it now so everybody can see it. There All right. So uh, the question, I guess, is uh, some of the, the tools and resources that, that our teachers are using. Uh, and we've got free resources, and we've got some that are paid for. Uh, so one of the biggest free resources that, that our teachers are using is ck12.org right now. Uh, that was, if you look on my title slide there, it, it will, uh, I, I'm an ambassador for them. Um, but I really believe in their content. It's Common Core Built Aligned Curriculum. It's mainly for STEM, for math and science. Uh, but if you go into your state, a lot of states have gone in and built their own books for ELA and for, uh, and for social studies. Uh, so, so that's, that's one of the resources we're using. I'm a big fan of a program called Edge Elastic. Uh, Edge Elastic is a test, uh, it's a testing software that you can build uh, technology enhanced questions with. Uh, and for the park assessment for Smarter Balance, uh, they've got questions already built in the line there. You can make your own technology enhanced questions. Uh, big fan of those guys. Because, you know, you can actually, you know, you got drag and drops, you've got highlighting tools, you got graphing tools. Uh, it can give you so much information about your students and where they're at. Uh, you know, and, and then you can, I, I generally go in and build my whole year out uh, for my students. I'll assign it in the beginning. And again, as, as they move and they master content, they can go through that. Um, we use a lot of Screencastify here uh, to, to build our own videos, things like that. Uh, I'm a fan of Khan Academy. Uh, I excel some some programs like that. Sam, any others you can think of that that I left out there that we're using? Uh, there, I mean, there, there's all kinds of. I and mean, she mentioned a good one a minute ago. That's that's a really good one. There, there's uh, just all kinds of stuff that 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 we use, and you know, we get a lot out of. We're Google District, so we get a lot out of Google tools and extensions and, and apps. And teachers are just knocking it out of the park with those. Google, Google Forms is one of my favorite. Yeah. Uh, you know, just to use for surveys and students and. And teachers back and forth, our our administrators uh, uh, use Google Classroom a lot across the district to communicate with their staffs. Uh, we've got uh, principals that are uh, flipping their uh, teacher meetings. So when they come into the meeting, they've already went over the material and, and teacher meetings are not taking as long. Uh, teachers love that. <laughs> so just just all kinds of tools. And, and I, I put a few of them down there. Lance mentioned on the on the chat for you okay. guys. But. Man, I mean, we could spend a whole hour just going through the, the tools, and that's exactly what uh, Lance and, and my session at FETC, if you're attending, increase student engagement with interactive design. Lance goes through all kinds of tools and then leaves a lot of them on there for you to go look at in his presentation, uh, which is uh, a, a very solid after presentation where you learn a whole lot, whether it's math, ELA, you know, science, social studies, whatever the situation might be, and, and just, uh, you know, those tools just add to the resource bucket of those teachers uh that in the classroom and get this thing going yeah i like to say that there's stuff in there that doesn't matter from the womb to the tomb k to k to, to to 12 you know there's tools in there that your your littles can do and then that uh your high school guys will be engaged into uh so you know no matter what you teach or uh, what grade level you teach there there's things in there that that you can use there seem to have been a lot of questions in the in the registration about well class sizes. You know, does this you know uh, it's relatively easy to personalize if your class sizes are five to ten people, but does do these techniques work when there, you have twenty five, thirty, or thirty five kids in a class? And what, well, uh, what do you have to do? All right, so uh, I guess two years ago, it's been been a couple of years now. Uh, I taught uh, integrated math one and two. Uh, which is for, for those that are in the algebra geometry series, that'd be algebra one and geometry. 
uh, I taught it to about 40 students at three different schools uh, through distance learning equipment. So I had about 25 students that's in the class with me was teaching two different subjects uh, at the same time. It, when you truly personalize learning and you become the facilitator of learning and not the sage on the stage, you can do it because now you are, you're there for troubleshooting. You're there to guide students. You're there to help them get through things or to guide their projects or to pull small groups to you and work with those guys one on one. But you, 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 clone, you cloned yourself, right? I cloned myself. Right. <laughs> Listen, and, and, the, and the cool thing, and I was in there several times, the cool thing in Lance's room and in teaching integrated math one and two at the same time, there were other students in that room that were doing other things that, wow. that weren't even that weren't even doing integrated math. But uh, and he could handle it. But the, the neat thing, they he may have a student that's on chapter three. Uh, in integrated math one and another student who's on chapter six. So, you know, you're not standing up there broadcasting one thing at one time. They're all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, and he just supports that and, and makes sure that they, the learning is taking place. The gaps uh, are handled and, and, you know, really getting that face time with those students. And, and, and it's a cool and unique thing, but you know, Lance didn't, uh, you know, didn't one day teach traditionally and then turn around the next day and teach like this. It, it, it takes a little bit of time to build up to something like that. And he's been doing it for a long, long time. So my advice to teachers out there is just find one thing that you want to do, introduce that to your classroom and then go on to the next thing and build on your skills as time goes on. And within two or three years, the next thing you know, you're not making any copies, you're not using any books and you're, you're truly, uh, you know, meeting the need of each individual student in the classroom, whether it be in a technology situation or not. Um, personalized learning is not about technology. Right. Well, and, and I, I, Mitch, I dare say that the, the way that the, the education world has changed since you or I were in high school has changed so much. Uh, when I was in school, you know, we didn't have Google. Um, so, you know, there, there's a Facebook post of, you know, they commend us for getting uh, education before Google was around. Uh, but the teacher held all the knowledge. Right. And I had to go to that teacher to get knowledge or my textbook. Well, well now the knowledge is everywhere. You know, I can I can Google how to change a headlight and there'll be a tutorial walk me straight through. How to change that <laughs> you don't want to see me work with tools, but I've done it before. Uh, you know, kids are playing video games and they'll Google how to beat a level on a video game. So most of our students now, if they want to know how to do something, they go straight to YouTube. And they punch it in and it shows them how to do it. The knowledge is no longer just the teacher. And that's how that we've had to change because that's what we grew up knowing, that I had to go to that teacher to get that knowledge. And then I regurgitated it on a test and then I might forget by the next week, but I regurgitated it on that test and, and that's how I got my grade. Now it's the knowledge is everywhere and, and us as teachers, because we didn't grow up that way, you know, we're probably considered a little bit of control freaks and, you know, the class, I've got to teach bell to bell and it's got to be this way. And, you know, if an administrator comes in and kids are up moving around and it looks a little disruptive, you know, what are they going to think? I don't have control of my class, you know? Mm -hmm. So we're having to change our modalities and our methods because the knowledge is now everywhere. We're not the only source of knowledge. Uh, but because of that, it's allowing us to be flexible so that we can meet all students' needs. And I can have a classroom of 30 or 40 and then be on all different levels because I can go over here and, and help a student with systems of equations. And I can go over here and help a student with an exponential equation. It doesn't matter because I can, I, you know, in, in five to ten seconds, I can redirect this student here. Do you find that any of the students or what do you do with, with the students when they just aren't motivated then? Because I can see how if students were, were, are really motivated, you know, they're going to be looking at the information themselves. But what if, what if, you know, traditionally the teacher's been there and, you know, you have to do this, you have to do this. And that's how we got the right. students. To do it. Yeah, Lance, well, one, well, thing, one, one thing, Lance, and then you, you take, that's definitely you. Mitch, that's a great point, but, if you go back to the definition of personalized learning, when, when you reach a student with what they're interested in, then it, it creates a more engaged student, unless they're just a kid who just doesn't want to do it. They have some discipline problems, whatever the situation might be. I know Lance could always revert back to his, you know, his old book plan. If, if need be, you know, he could t still teach in a traditional mode. And, and there's a lot of great uh, characteristics of good teaching that involves the traditional mode. So we're not changing all that. You know, we're just adding things in there that will 
engage and drive that student learning and, and create a motivated student along the way. Go ahead, Lance. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Oh, you're fine. You know, and, and that's, you know, when I run into those students uh, and before, you know, three years ago, I, I ran our credit recovery at our largest high school. Um, what, what I believe in is you have to pour into those students then. You know, you have to work harder to form those relationships with those students. You have to show them why it's important that they're going to do it. You know, you have to build them up. You have to coach them up, uh, you know, to get them motivated to do it. And, and then after you do that, you know, generally you can't get rid of those kids. They want to be with you all the time and they want to, you know, to show you that they can do it. So, you know, just pour into them and, and show it. And, you know, and, and the problem that, that I've actually seen is students that have left these classrooms and that have gone back into a traditional classroom where it's face to face. And, you know, you've got a teacher that's lecturing and they're going through the content all at the same pace. Then they they they're bored. They they don't want to be there. They, they've got a taste of, of, of what it's like. And now they're having to go back. So that's that's where we have seen problems. Hmm. Fascinating. So, um, yeah, we're, we're just about at the top of the hour. So do you have any uh, closing advice for people who are maybe here live or people who are going to be watching the archives? Yeah, man, my, my best advice, Mitch, and, you know, start small, pick out something that can work for your classroom and, and that you, you know, because you're going to walk in one day and the, and the wireless is down. <laughs> so you're going to have to be ready for that. So, you know, bite off enough that you can you can work with that and and get it to the students. Don't my, I guess my biggest thing, Mitch, don't be afraid to learn from these students because it seems like they are born uh, digital natives now. And a lot of our learning as far as what we need to know can can come from them. And as teachers and educators and administrators, we can't be afraid to learn from them. Yep. And I, I would say, you know, don't be afraid to step out of their comfort zone and don't be afraid to mess up because inevitably, as Sam says, you're going to have the best lesson plan and something's going to happen and it's going to go wrong. And you're going to have to punt and, and start all over. And, you know, I've had to reteach lessons before uh, because it, it just went awry. Uh, and that's okay. That's okay. But, you know, to, to not do nothing and to only meet 40% of our students needs, which I feel like being the stage on the stage we do, uh, is no longer okay. We've got to push so that all students learn. Okay. Well, I, I, you know, I'd say that if, as you've shown, you can teach 40 kids in a class basically two different subjects, 25 of them in one room and 15 of them spread across other buildings, then this really works. <laughs> so what, what you put together sounds is, you know, phenomenal. Thank you for sharing so much with us today. And um, I'm looking forward to meeting you both in person at FETC. Awesome. Yeah, it's been our pleasure. And thanks to everybody who joined. I, I hope it was worth your while. And uh, you guys have an awesome day. And, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll meet up with you soon. Okay. Well, um, yeah, have a good afternoon. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll bring you down. And this is Mitch Weisberg uh, signing off for EdChat Interactive and hope to see everybody at FETC in a couple of weeks. Um, take care.